This is PodKit, episode 22, QAQ. And now, let the I.O. flow through. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk22. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hello. So, lots of stuff has happened, and it's only been a week since we last talked. That's Plus, amazing. <laughs> we're back on right? track. For sure, for sure. Well, for one thing, we were on an episode of a show. What show? What? Second Opinion, that's the show. Second Opinion? Yeah. What's that? I don't know. We were on it, but I don't know what it is. Ryan, can you tell us a little more about it? Well, it's been so long since I published... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This particular episode was on Gboard and Google Keyboard, where Brian and Brandon and Ian, because he suddenly is an iOS owner, had talked about the new keyboard offering from the Google called Gboard. And uh, Ian and I also talked about the first really big major update for Google Keyboard in quite some time. So that was a it was a pretty good show, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's you know talking about keyboard. So how interesting can it be? But uh, there's a lot of new features, and it's good. Indeed, indeed. And I actually have some follow out to borrow a word from uh, uh, the rest of the podcasting world. Um, I've actually been using Gboard inadvertently on my iPad for the past like three weeks. It's just been like randomly showing up as the keyboard I use. And I'm like, well, if it's the keyboard that's active, I guess I'm going to use it. And it's actually pretty neat. Um, I stand by everything I said in that episode. And if you want to hear more of those thoughts, uh, you can hear them in said episode, which is SO number six. So I will also give you some follow out then. So uh, I've had the Google keyboard updated version for quite some time i had it even before it was officially released because of reasons and um this weekend i i I was at my grandmother's house and uh her phone which is my old old very old nexus 5 had also received the new google keyboard update well when i when i picked up her phone and i inspected it and i wanted to search for something it, it came to my attention that somehow she had enabled the one-handed mode accidentally so in in the new keyboard if you long hold on the enter key thing and you swipe in a particular way it will just just one hand your keyboard to you know the left or the right and so she for a week or so had been using this microscopic keyboard because she never figured out how to get out of it and it and it's and mm-hmm. it, it's not like cancel or anything it's just some arrows so that was amusing Hmm. so in addition to follow out which i can also say i i uh use gboard on my ipad now so going well no complaints we do have some follow up from (laughs) three days ago from andrew bailey saying Hi, Ryan. It's me again. Long time no podcast. Your drop sounds identical to Stevens, except he uses .NET instead. Well, that's uh, that's great. I um, Unfortunately, I don't know .NET anymore. I used to. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's all changed since I was a young person. Also, I have no idea how you get any of that feedback, because I certainly do not. It goes yeah, right to my so- junk folder, and I just keep it there until we record the next po- episode. <laughs> You know, I I really should investigate because I don't I don't get any of this. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Uh, <laughs> hey, look. Okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't notice that either because I guess I had the same the same thing. I should what, probably go to what was Gmail. The t- what was the title of the secret email? Um, it was. Podkit dash dash the dash nexus dot tv contact form. Yeah, never got it. I don't know. Haunted. <laughs> so is this because so so Gmail says that uh, it's considered spam because it's in violation of Google's recommended email sender guidelines. I'm sure which it includes is. Things, things like using a consistent IP address to send bulk mail, uh, keeping valid reverse DNS records from the IP address uh, from which you send mail pointing to your domain. Uh, I have all of that. And signing messages with DKIM. Uh, I might not have that. 
publishing an SPF record. I should have that. Sounds like that has something to do with sunscreen. I could be wrong. Um, um, could. <laughs> and then publishing a DMARC policy, which is you know you know what I hate about email that it sucks. Yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. So if, if I'm we going to go with the route of yeah adding the Nexus feedback to my contacts, and maybe it'll show that to me now instead of auto junk it. But we'll see. So let's see here. What else do we have on our list? Um, do we want to talk about um, my stuff or some cool other stuff? No, we should talk about your stuff first, and then that will be a great lead into the other stuff. Okay, so... Perfect. Uh, I've been thinking about making a new blog and everybody is rejoicing at home yeah. right now, I think. And um, so it turns out whenever I, uh, you know, work on code, I, I, you know, you, you experience problems, you experience issues, you find solutions or you don't find solutions and you have to make work around yourself. And then, you know, then, then what? So then what you should do ideally is write about it so that other people don't have to struggle with all of what you did. And mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I, I want to do this is because at work, it, it, we use Java. And uh, I don't know if either of you have never noticed this, but Java and sort of probably .NET and in general enterprise languages like Java and .NET, it seems to me like, unlike PHP and JavaScript and Rust and Go, new languages and languages that aren't so entrenched in the enterprise. Yeah. There's almost nothing written about them publicly by normal people. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I've been when I've been working on uh, Spring Boot stuff, and Spring Boot is a framework similar to Laravel or you mm -hmm. know, Django or you know, so it's a web framework. Mm -hmm. When 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 I when I when I look at this and I try to find people writing. Uh, about it for air messages or examples or you know code samples there's just it's just a big black hole it's pretty much empty on github Agreed. if i were to type in repository examples php i would get a hundred thousand suggestions if i did the same thing with java i'd maybe get like six thousand <laughs> mm -hmm. yep <laughs> and they'd all be something different well, so actually, not the thing you were looking for. Actually, yeah. in my experience, they're almost all identical because what happens is yep. people will fork the thing on GitHub or copy mm -hmm. the code to follow the okay. tutorial and have it on GitHub, and then it's you know the same incomplete code that's useless. Right, right, exactly. So, so it's it's all not the thing that you were looking for. Yeah, it's all not the thing. The same, so it's the same thing. I want. But you can pick your you can pick your favorite fork and just go off of that one instead. Yeah, but they're all incomplete. They're all not my favorite. <laughs> Yeah, pull request all of them to make it complete. Well, I, Every I, single one. I mean, I guess I could, but I feel like um, I feel like they'll. That wouldn't be. Good. I feel like it won't work. So I guess, I, I guess what I was talking to somebody at work the other day, and um, I, I was explaining to them what I think about the culture of what we do. So we're consultants, and I know we're supposed to be working for a client, but I think as people who write code in the modern world we should also be contributing back to the community. Like when I think about the JavaScript community, I think about the JavaScript IRC channel. I think about all of the JavaScript blogs. Right. I think about us mm. talking on this show about JavaScript all the time. And Indeed. I don't know if this exists for Java, but it feels a lot more closed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's not really like a community around Java that comes to mind. No, I think no, but there is, it's just, JavaScript. where are they? Yeah. Yeah. Inside of each of their own company, mm -hmm. probably. So uh, yeah, that, that's the uh, that's the blog thing. It's not up yet. It might be up, you know, a couple a weekend or two from now when I have time again. Uh, I will be making it with uh, Hugo, of course, Static Site Generator. It will be synced up with the GitHub. Um, it's a really nice way to make a blog um, because should I want to change it, move it to a new location, or do anything. All I have to do is have it rewrite the base links, and it will. It's great. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Um, so the first thing I will be putting on the blog, though, is from my um, work Bitbucket account. And um, this is a little experiment I made, Spring Data Rest Playground. And basically, um, 
we were working on working on a user management system which comprises mm-hmm. of the very commonly found things in a user management system like accounts groups and roles nice yeah i'm sure everybody mm-hmm. has coded this at least six times in their life already right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well um this was a challenge for us and so we took three weeks to do this and so this week and basically i did the groundwork of of that three weeks in in like three hours by mm-hmm. by actually reading documentation that was very hard to find and looking at source code and and experimenting on a real computer mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nice so um i've I've learned quite a bit about how spring and spring data rest work and it's really nice so i'm i'm uh i'm I'm going to write about that and it's going to be great all right awesome i look forward to it yeah Yeah, me too yeah because i know everybody wants to read about java no seriously though it's kind of funny too just as i'm tidying up my work with uh with spring in particular this is this is uh, very much the same thing that that i have found with that anytime you try to learn anything about it it's immediately um everyone points to the same as you mentioned incomplete code samples and yep. it's going to be really cool to see um you putting your awesome uh documentary in mind towards it because that'll, yeah. be, that'll be good uh so one of the things so you know i'm, I'm sure I, I i can't spill i can't spill the beans i mean i'm not spewing work related secrets here for either <laughs> our client or for dowerty but one thing i can do is i can abstract pretty heavily what we're doing and, and you know accounts groups and roles those are all really common things and it's a, yeah. an application for for an api that everybody will have seen or will need eventually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so to finish up here to make all of this um working at home stuff with my own vm and to make all of this podcasting easier and to make just my whole life better i decided to buy some solid state drives and some monitors nice so i bought two Hmm. solid state drives the drives are dedicated one each for recording slash editing and um virtual machines nice nice that's awesome yep so that'll be really quite nice let the io flow through (laughs) yep (laughs) so the the audio you are listening to right now dear listener has been recorded directly onto a solid state drive Ooh, it feels so modern (laughs) Yeah, doesn't, doesn't Indeed. feel so fast. Super speedy. <laughs> well, hey, um, while while we're talking about uh, new things, relatively recent things, um, I was at a place last week. I heard that, that place was called San Francisco, and there's some fun stuff there. Um, the first one I thought was really interesting, and this kind of gets into a philosophical discussion we've we've uh, planned to have for some time now, uh, and that is agile. Agile is a thing that um, is really in vogue. Uh, for project management philosophy, uh, whether you are in, it, it kind of sprung out of the software development side of the world, but it, I've seen it in other places too, um, which is kind of neat, sort of, it, depending on how you feel about Agile. Now, I don't believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we've had this uh, conversation yet on the show. No, we have not. I don't think so, no. Well, um, Agile is kind of a, a polarizing thing in some cases too, because um, Agile and its many implementations can have some weird side effects or don't always work for every sort of team, like many sort of project management methodologies. They don't work for everybody. But this conference I was at was really interesting because they had this whole section uh, of the of the day one keynote about how agility um, helps this company do do their thing. Um, so yeah, we've got some, some links into the basics of what agile, agile is there, which is neat. Uh, basically the point is to iterate a lot, work on small teams and, um, be ready to change things drastically if you need to. Um, but hopefully the point is if you iterate enough, um, you won't need to make drastic changes. You'll only need to make small changes. Does that sound about right? Yeah, so mm-hmm. I, I would I would always build in the comparison to, you know, bet- between now and the old days where you had the waterfall, where you, you know, did all the planning, or you, you did all the plan- requirements, you did all the planning, you did all the code writing, you did all the testing, and you did all of the delivering in that order, and that's it, versus Agile as a design method where you... You iterate a little bit, you get more requirements, you show it off, you refine, you iterate, and you repeat. 
Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I worked on a team that used a, a method that's a slightly um, modified kind of agile strategy called Kanban or Kanban. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. Never. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever run into that. I, don't, I have. I don't even know if we've ever talked to this at some point. I've heard of it. I don't remember how it works. Yeah. Well, do I have a Wikipedia article for you? <laughs> it's the. Uh, it came out of Toyota actually, and hmm. um, it seems almost indistinguishable from Scrum. Yes. Uh, or the way that we were doing Scrum. Yeah. But it also is kind of nicer because the the cognitive load of it's a little bit easier. I guess I'd say, um, because you have, um, I, on my team in particular, we have the kind of weird situation of everybody, um, all, all of the full-timers at least, um, essentially have the same role. We didn't really have like a different QA team. Mm-hmm. Um, but what just happened is if one person did the development on it, another person would do the QA on it. Right, of course. Um, so... So as a result, like when something would be in QA, everyone would have like their QA queue. Oh wow, that's a okay. Um, <laughs> their their uh, the 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 stuff that they were supposed to test uh, and the stuff that they were supposed to review, um, and then it would be approved if if it were approved, and then it would move out into the world. Um, but one of the interesting things about Kanban is that um, it actually uh, ev- essentially everything is in your backlog. Yep. And and mm-hmm. that's that's nicer to us than than Scrum, which has a separate backlog, um, because essentially uh, the tr- the trick with Scrum is that it's it's very difficult for us to put something on deck because on deck things, so things that we're about ready to to start working on, almost always just end up going back into the backlog anyhow because times change, requirements change, mm-hmm. stuff like that. I don't know what you guys' have ex- experiences have been with Agile and these other kind of methods. Um, but I think now would be an interesting time if you guys want to talk about that to do so. Sure. So uh, I just pulled up my Kanban Flow Kanban board here. Uh, so we use KanbanFlow.com. I don't know if you've heard of that one. It, it's, a, it's a pretty nice board. Uh, it's pretty handy. So I, I, I can just tell you our columns if that's helpful. Nice. So we have requests and then planning and then product backlog, which is, you know, pretty much where everything goes once it's been, you know, decided that we actually want it. Then we have the sprint backlog. And so they're sort of mixing Scrum and sort of not, which is sort of mm-hmm. weird. Then we have in progress, which is where we're supposed to put the things we're actually working on, uh, which is really nice. I mean, in, in this particular tool, you just, you just drag these things from column to column. Yep. Then we have integration, which is, you know, tests and stuff. You know, so after the code has been written, I guess they expect you to actually do tests for it, which is good. Then we have ready, (laughs) ready for QA. It's not in QA. It's ready for QA. Mm -hmm. Then we have QA and then we have ready for UAT. And then we have UAT. Then we have ready to release. And then we have done. Nice. Hmm. That's very similar to what we use. Yeah. So uh, we used we used um, Kanban for PA Logic, our, my previous project, and uh, you know it seemed to work out pretty well for us. It um, you know the project was smaller. Um, we didn't have a lot of people in one location. We had people all over the place. So we had people here in office. We had people at our client site. So it was nice to be able to work through this this system for that. For sure, for sure. Yeah, that's that's. Very awesome. I know that we've used Trello for situations mm-hmm. like that, and it's very similar looking. Yep, yep very similar. Um, yeah, I've used Trello before. But uh, the the particular like tool that I've used on a team that considers itself to be like, or that intended to consider itself to be agile was Jira, Atlassian Jira. Yes. I don't know if you guys have ever. Yes, I I'm I'm like. familiar. Yes. So there there you go. Jira is kind of like a less flexible bat, it seems. Yeah. So uh, we can talk about that now or right after this one, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I guess we can talk about it right after this one, can't we? Sure. Let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Whenever you're um, ready, let me know. I'll tell you all about Jira. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so the next thing I found uh, at this conference was um, a, a bunch of cool new products from uh, from the Twilio folks. So Signal, the conference I went to, is the, is the kind of like Twilio's WWDC. Yes. In fact, I would venture to say that that is exactly what it is. I think so. I mean, looking at your slides here, yeah, that's exactly what it is. 
complete with black turtleneck and gigantic LED walls. Yes, <laughs> yep, you um, got it. And in fact, they they even did a Steve Jobs style um, call a random place and oh my gosh. Uh, ask it about stuff, and that was pretty fun. That's great. Uh, I bet I bet I have the tweet from that somewhere. Um, and it was it was pretty it was pretty awesome. Uh, admittedly, uh, it was it was really cool to see. But the the products that they um, unveiled, one of which was really cool uh, in particular, was their programmable wireless. And um, essentially, what they do now is they'll they'll sell you a SIM card, and you can put that in whatever device you like, and then you can assign that SIM card some kind of plan, some kind of voice, SMS, MMS, and data. Uh, combination that lets you uh, give that SIM card that certain level of access. Okay, all well and good, right? That's basically like a programmable um, version of of what you might say you already have with um, with modern like cell carriers with yeah. Verizon. Right. Mm-hmm. But some of the things that are really cool about it is that um, what Twilio has made it s- such that um, you can manage and provision all this stuff programmatically, right? So instead of having to um, like go into a, a store, right? And, and register all those phones, I guess, I, I don't know how companies do it, um, but you could essentially mail order those SIM cards or pff, mail order, huh. look at me talking like I'm from the eighties. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you could You could essentially send an API request for like, oh, give me 1500 SIM cards. Uh, and then you could set up a way to like onboard employees programmatically, right? You could you could have a little app that's like, oh, just like register your SIM card, plop it in your phone, and you're good. Uh, and you can have all this like weird stuff that goes along with it. So you can build like your own cell kill cell carrier if you wish, um, with all that stuff. Just like, what? That's pretty neat. Um, but the other neat thing about it is you can use that programmable wireless for internet of things Mm -hmm. uh, applications. So they have this idea of a thing called like a command, right? Yep. Um, And essentially what, what happens is you can, um, you can set up um, some sort of a service somewhere, a web server somewhere. And um, you could use that to somehow make a call to to a Twilio API that will, if, if you give it like the, the device number, and the command you want it to have, Twilio will um, rather inexpe- rather inexpensively f- send a message to that um, to that uh, SIM card, the device the device attached to that SIM card, and um, and you can then do something with it on on that end. And they they did it really cool with this thing called their hack pack. So I guess I should have thought of it this ahead of time. Um, a hack pack is like a little a little. It's, it's, it's the conference swag that they give out. It's pretty neat. Um, and this one had a bunch of stuff built into it, including a Twilio SIM card, um, a GPS radio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and um, uh, what else? GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular. Oh, yeah, cellular. Um, and they had this really neat thing where it would um, essentially dump a readout of all the sensors to to the screen. So as everyone was walking around, you could see um, like who all was where based on their based on their hack pack. It was mm-hmm. kind of neat. That is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So th- and that's that sort of thing makes it really neat. Like one of the things I want to do is I want to make it uh, a way to control this LED light that I have. That's Bluetooth low energy, but mm-hmm. um, it it right now has a really crappy proprietary app that I don't like. Yeah. Um, turns out I can at least turn it off and on by uh with some basic stuff um that's available in most languages uh bindings to the bluetooth subsystem on most computers so that's kind of fun nice um so it's it's really neat uh really neat thing that those folks are working on uh and it was cool to see a handful of talks on it um i guess one other matter of of uh kind of interest related to signal is they started doing these smaller events including one in london it's coming up this uh fall i'm not going because it's made for british people and uh, it's during the school year, and London's pricey, so it's never it's stopped bad. you before. But that's <laughs> it has stopped me before. Okay. Believe you me, I was I was so close to going to Scotland JS this uh, this summer, but I didn't do it because um, <laughs> because I I was just going to San Francisco the week prior for Signal. Yeah, and and that would have been a lot. Europe's expensive, but there you go. That's that's the lowdown on Signal. Now let's talk about Jira. 
So, um, so, uh, so about Signal though. So you saw Kevin there. You bet I did. Yeah, yeah so I that... saw Kevin. I saw Rob Spector. I saw Andrew Tork Baker. I saw a bunch of really awesome folks. Sam Agnew, who's who's going to make uh, an appearance on the Twitter followies this this afternoon. Yeah. So you 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 found all of the Twilio Twilio people. That's good. Yes. So when when they introduced all this stuff, did they actually like say how much any of this actually costs? Yes, yes, yes. They had lots of lots of slides about the uh, the pricing there. I didn't take any pictures of them because um, I'm goofy and I did not consider that. But um, the the SMS and MMS messaging uh, for Twilio Wireless cost the same as a Twilio SMS or MMS message does. In, Regular, if, yeah. if you make it from through the through mm-hmm. their API, yeah, yeah, well, that's pretty good then. Um, and I think data data had a really interesting pricing model too um, that I totally forgot. I so found the pricing page. I figured it out. All right, all right, <laughs> man, that took a lot of work. So let's see here. Uh, pooled pooled metering, two dollars per active sim per month for the first five hundred sims. Data starting right. at ten cents a megabyte. Uh, individual meeting is available. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Usage pricing, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Right, it's it's like not too shabby when 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 you uh, right. when you think about it. The one trick is that it's all based on T-Mobile uh, in the U.S. right now, which means that it's not going to work very well for me. <laughs> well, I but, think um, I think it's you know it, if if you're a big business or if you're an IoT and you're you, well, okay, big business. I mean, if you're a small business and you're doing IoT yeah. <laughs> and you want to have you don't want to make any of this stuff yourself and you don't have that kind of infrastructure, obviously. This is good enough because uh, a startup will probably be in a major city somewhere with T-Mobile support. Right, 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 right. That's for sure. They're not going to be out in, out in the middle of nowhere like no. this kid. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, so that, that, that is, uh, that's a pretty neat thing. And the, the nice thing about the, twi- the SIM card that's in the, um, the hack pack is that they've already have it set up with a certain kind of app. And if I wanted to develop a different app uh, application for that hack pack, I'd have to unhook the SIM and put it to my account, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there's this pretty neat as is. So I'll probably just like um, plug it in and be like, "Hey, look, it works. That's kind of nice for a little while." <laughs> yeah. But also Jira. So Jira. So if you don't know what Jira is, Jira is uh, the um, I don't know what you would call it. It's it's sort of like the what are you working on right now product from. Elastian, also known as the people who make Bitbucket. So Jira has a bunch of different components to it. So I, I guess the, the, the most common one, though, is the thing that won't open here, also known as what they call the rapid board. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Come on, Jira. Open. Good work. Thank you. So uh, we are currently in Sprint 8 at work. So this is for more of a scrummy kind of, you know, workflow. Is that, mm-hmm. is that, is that what they call it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, in in our Jira, we have three columns. We have to do, in progress, and done, which is sort of sad because I wish we had more granularity in our in in the status, like almost done or not going to get done or super. What were we thinking when we put this on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So let me scroll down here to my group section five sixty four. Five? Wow, these aren't in order anymore. So each group gets what well, I, I guess we get a story, and then we take the story and we make tasks for the story, mm-hmm. and then we go and do it. So the story, That's the dream. The, the story gets a task, and then there are subtasks in that task. So we were we I I was in the group working on user management. So we have things like build out our database API. Build out our L, uh, LDAP API, make integration tests, make our web UI, and you know stuff like that. And yeah. and so I I I don't mind Jira. It's good, good enough anyway. But I wish there was more flexibility in the things that I could do. So if I wanted to have a list of tasks, it would be really great if I could order them in the priority that I want them to be done in. Uh, and mm-hmm. I can't really. I can move them up and down one at a time. So if I have something in slot 12, it would take 20 clicks to move it up to slot one. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. ideal. Right. Uh, well, it, 
Jira definitely seems like one of those tools that's like, it's not really for you. It's no. for the team. It's not for you. Yeah. yeah it's, it, like, it, mm. it's almost not even really for the team, to be honest. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so one of the things that at work, you know, every sprint we have a retrospective and, you know, everybody says, well, you know, I wish we, I wish everybody was updating their Jira tasks more often. And I <laughs> think that, you know, you could just look at Git and you could just look, look at the Bitbucket account you have all of the history. You can tell what we're doing. Yeah. So I kind of wish there was some more integration between Jira and, and Bitbucket. Um, and then, of course, we also have Confluence, which is our um, wiki. So we put all of the the wiki stuff on the Confluence. Mm-hmm. See, that's really interesting to me because I thought that, like, that was the whole point of using Bitbucket and Jira together. Because, I mean, we've even, we've even tried to do some of that with... Um, GitHub and Jira, or Git, Git and Jira. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I guess there is some integration. So, if if it, when when we start a new sprint, we can we can click on create branch, and so then Jira will create the branch for, in Bitbucket for this task to be worked on. But and and I guess we could, in theory, if we were being so diligent and we're not, we could for each subtask make another branch. But um, that's too many branches for us. That does sound like a lot of branches. So this 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 user administra- uh, user management and administration API, we have twelve subtasks here, and I can't imagine having twelve branches for this one thing. Right, right. See, what I'm thinking is like when I kind of like what in, in a Git issue, right? How you can yep. me- reference the issue in the commit message. Yep and close it from there. Like that's the sort of thing that I like would like to have where yeah. I'm using both Jira and, uh, and uh, Bitbucket, which yeah. I'm not. I, I don't even know. Is there a way to really reference? I guess there must be a way to reference a task or a subtask in a commit, uh, in a commit message, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I think this is the, this here. I'll, I'll see if I can pop it in here real quick. This is the thing that I'm kind of looking for. Linking Bitbucket and Jira. Yeah, so just like that. I'm, I know there's a way to okay. do it, but I, I just I don't know what the method to do it is. Yeah, probably cost money too. Well, <laughs> I don't know if you can reference commits and issues. I don't know if you can. Can you reference an issue in a commit message on GitHub? I think yeah, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've done it before. Hmm. So it's probably something pretty similar to that then. Maybe. I wonder I wonder if I have done it anywhere useful. Anywhere nope. useful. So so then there's also this this concept of the backlog, uh, which is where all the things we don't get done during our regular sprint slash work or I mean so that, that stuff goes there. Or it's stuff that didn't fit into a sprint. So um mm-hmm. that that's that that's usually fairly fairly pretty much everything basically. And I don't know how much of this backlog is relevant anymore. And so that's also one of the things that happened to the backlog. It gets stale very quickly. Right. Uh, so user management, we are, we, we made a huge chunk of functionality here. We've probably invalidated, you know, 10, 10 to 20 of these <laughs> um, things. And I don't know, is there a way to see how many things are in the backlog? 173 things in the backlog right now. <laughs> yep. Uh, so let's see what else do we have here. We have releases, but we haven't released anything, so don't 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 click that. Um, yep. We have issues. We have no issues because it's not even a live product yet. Right. Perfect. It yeah. works. It works. No, 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 or does it? Um, there there is a way, but I'm just too blind to figure it out. I guess. Uh, there's a way to see the epics, but I don't know how to get there. Yes. Yeah, so depending on how you have your Jira set up, you have to go into like view all issues mode instead of view this view the board mode okay yeah Uh, i believe you but i still don't i don't see this is one of those problems with jira it barely works right 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 so like for me i have uh on my sidebar i have the option to do um wow nothing loads (laughs) i know it's very slow today yep and ours is on prem so it shouldn't be that slow so there's the board, there's the releases, there's the reports, there's the components, and then there's issues. You have to go to the issues view in order to view epics, I think. I found I think. it. Show epics panel. 
Okay, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 21 epics. Hmm. So for any listeners wondering, an epic is a container for stories, and a story is something the client wants, and when they're related, they go into an epic. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, like, when you, I don't know, you've, you've been doing this longer than me, Brandon, so when you started doing this kind of stuff, like, how much did you buy into it initially? Oh, I loved it. It was awesome. I was like, my work is so compartmentalized, I can, like, understand you know, I can I can draw a line from when somebody somebody defined this thing to the thing that I do, and then the way it was reviewed and the way it was finished, and I can see that whole path. Like that life cycle is really clear. That's awesome. Um, the trick is, it's really hard to get people to review stuff. <laughs> well, uh, we actually made a solution for that. So uh, yeah, uh, we actually do group reviews now. Hmm. Oh, nice! And everybody really likes it, actually. So. Um, you pick two, two to three reviewers plus the app arc, and then we all go into the conference room. We put up the code on the projector with the diff screen, and we go and look at it. And we all talk about it, and it's great. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It is really nice. And and ba- and and we've been told pick a different reviewer every time, and you know rotate through so that everybody gets to see different code eventually. Blah blah blah. And it's really nice. Yeah. Everybody really likes it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I guess I asked the earlier question, how much you got into it, because to me, the the concept of these epics and stories and tasks, it's all sort of artificial. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, when I'm when I'm working on my own stuff and it's like, OK, well, I know what I want, so I'm just going to go make it. And I and I and I get it. And so I know we're just assigning names to, you know, things to make. But yeah. there's a lot of overhead in all of this stuff. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think one of the things I like about it is that, um, like, I've I've always really bought into like the the GTD sort of you know Franklin Covey philosophy stuff because I find that really interesting. But you're right that there's a point where if the overhead becomes like if you start um, if one of your tasks becomes update Jira, right? <laughs> if, if you have to have a story for that, that's kind of a problem. Uh, as as a user, I want Jira to be updated so that everybody is always on task. No, that's not a story. Stop it. And and and, um, and, and in literally in every retro, somebody writes, down, "I wish the tasks were updated more frequently." And it's like, go away. We're busy. <laughs> yep. Yep. There's no. There's there's nothing for it. There's nothing for it. Yeah. And see, that's why that's why the daily stand up meetings are so awesome. I feel is because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just like okay look at everything in to-do, tell us about what's in to-do, and if it's not in to-do, we'll move it back to the backlog. Like, So yeah, I guess our, our stand-ups are a little different. So because we have a two-week sprint, we know pretty much what we're working on. We're, we're assigned a fairly large chunk of do this, and mm-hmm. then the subtasks take care of the what am I doing context. Mm-hmm. And so we never really have anything to do from the backlog unless we get done early. Ah, see, mm-hmm. for us, everything is in the backlog. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, so when we, when we do sprint planning, we, we make new things to do for that, that week and a half time period. And then if we're, we're bored, we go through the backlog and do stuff. Or we just cancel stuff outright because we ended up doing it in that week's work. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, our... our schedule doesn't our, our rhythm doesn't doesn't uh would not fit that that uh that that plan but that's a okay <laughs> yeah nope. i don't know I, i'm still i'm still reluctant so my thoughts on all of this are <laughs> yes uh, as the not worker worker <laughs> i i did a little i got some training and things on agile at where i interned last summer but it was more me and the other intern working on our own, nothing super duper formal. We did a little agile-ness for a week, a little more of a sprint where we had the rest of the team working for us. But other than that, I look forward to doing this all in the future. <laughs> you know, it, I think um, I, I was telling telling my parents, you know, earlier, you know, I used to be a programmer, now I'm a software engineer. And what separates me from before and now is all the extra overhead I have because I actually work somewhere. Mm-hmm. 
and and so it's it's weird to me that I have to now, you know, talk to people about the meta process of what we're doing. Right, right, right. And that's one of the things that I find really fascinating about it. It is fascinating, uh, but it's also annoying. <laughs> nope, understood. Well, well, let's see. Enough boring work stuff. What else do we have? More boring work stuff. Oh man, uh, this one is a really fun link I found called Git and GitHub for Poets. Um, it's this person who explains Git and GitHub uh, in as um, so that he can put a poem on GitHub. And basically, it's all about how Git is a thing that software engineers and software developers, I guess I should say, like the software world has kind of owned this thing for a long time. But it has a lot of benefits that can uh, kind of seep outside that for uh, folks who are not developers. So I think yeah. that's a really interesting kind of it's, it's about 20 minutes, I think. Um, but it's a pretty neat way to like um, talk through the way that um, I think somebody's running a blender. Sorry about that. Not a problem. <laughs> uh, it, it's a really neat way to uh, to talk through like way, a way to use Git that isn't um, full of code, which right. is really awesome. I think yeah. for for folks like um, some of the people I work with who just like aren't developers and don't want to be developers and don't want to learn it. Um, because it's seen as like a developer tool because it can be so much more than that if it if it needs to be i really like his video setup like he has a podium with his laptop or mac presumably and then he right. has the green screen and then he must have monitors on the side so that he he can see when he points to things on the screen but looking the other way right what a nice Isn't setup awesome yeah that's cool so have you Maybe ever used for that. Mm -hmm. so have either of you ever used git for a non-code code thing I'm I use may not get right now, but that's uh, debatably code because it's LaTeX. Yeah, that's that might as well be code. Um, well, okay. I mean, account. if you if if it's primarily Markdown, like, have you ever used it for that purpose? Yeah. Yep. Um, that's. I don't think that's up. Uh, oh, yes, I might have one that's up in the world about that. Yes, I do. Aha! It, remember when I set up the uh, YubiKey to do like two factor yes. uh, computer authentication. Absolutely. Yeah, I I did um I that's mostly marked down. Almost all that's marked down. Yep. Um what else? I also have um some boilerplate package manager -y things. Um that's has like it's all config files in markdown. Mm -hmm. Um and then I've all, I've used it uh like on my own computer. I've never pushed this up to GitHub, but I've used it on my own computer for um how would you call it for like uh, for images and text files at times, like uh, like notes, seaside notes. Yep. Um, but I just do that so it's easy to move them from place to place. Yep. I never I, put them on on GitHub because I don't like putting notes out into the world like yeah. that. Yeah, I have a um, for work. I have a, a notes like work notes repo. It's not public nice. and it's not you know synced up to a server or anything, but it is really nice to be able to have Git so that when I, you know make changes i can save it into something and then track those changes it's quite nice mm -hmm. uh i also use the the gist on the github very frequently for just writing words and not necessarily code yeah i i've done that too i think i once had a a christmas list in github gist 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 yeah it's just nice well is it gif or gif it's for you th this one's a gist and that one's a gif <laughs> It's a Girardelli. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed. No, for sure. I, I think you're right. It's it's neat, and I've seen other people use it for uh, like books, books held in GitHub. Yeah. Oh yeah, I and I guess like giant uh, user generated documentation in one giant Markdown file. I've seen. So one big readme. For sure. For sure. And it's neat stuff for it. Well, with that all said and done, uh, I think it's time for uh, Brian to talk a little bit more about the iOS app that he's been working on. Yes. Yeah. So this is the one I've probably mentioned in the past about starting at Curl Hacks in April. The last week or so I've worked on it more. And it's basically a BP beats per minute tracking. So you tap on the screen and it'll tell you your beats per minute as you are tapping. And I just have been working on um, adding a settings view and then some more things for theming. So that that big in the in the linked video, 
sweet demo, there's a, a, a circular button that you're tapping. And this is, um, oh, what is it called? I think it's a, a ZF button, ZF ripple button, which is on a Cocoa Pod and it's also on GitHub. Um, took that, had to override the draw rect uh, function to draw a circle instead, and then add in a variable that I can set for changing the, the stroke color. But it took me a while to figure out how to do that. So I got that yesterday. And I um, I tweeted a tweet that said, right. uh, that one, what was it? That moment when you get something working after having troubles for weeks. Yeah, I saw that one. That's that's what that was, said in the color of that button. So something very simple. But making progress, I built a, a I didn't build, I set up a little site on get bpm.xyz nice. using some GitHub pages template. So I, I, I plan to finish the settings screen and hopefully make that more themable. I think I have to subclass and the entire table view just to be able to set colors, but in time. So yeah, coming soon, the App Store near you, hopefully by the end of the summer. Wait, so is it going to be at the App Store in Rosedale or is, huh. wait. <laughs> I mean, maybe if it's featured Apple, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to really want this app, but it's something fun to do. So for do, sure, do you for have sure. an icon? Oh, I do. Um, uh, let me find the icon for it. I didn't, uh, this was, the icon was made by the other guy who I started with, Zach Litzinger. And it's a pretty nice icon. I'll put it in Slack here. Cool. Nice. Um, this was Photoshop. Uh, let me see if I can get a timestamp. 1.05 a.m. So it wasn't <laughs> early in the day, and it it was a a quick a quick make, but it looks pretty good. I would see there's no anti-aliasing on that on the border, but whatever. Maybe a new icon in the future at some point will happen. Oh, wow, that's awesome though. So cool that you both made it in such short uh, short time. That's the fun part of hackathons. Yeah, it's it's come along quite a bit since. Basically having a, a button that's not a toggle and having a table that's dynamically filled with themes and more to come, too. It would be nice. Yeah, nice. That, is, that, that icon is fantastic. For I sure. like it a lot, yeah. So that's so what, what I got. Say, what do you say? Should we move on to uh, everyone's favorite segment where we talk about the people we followed on Twitter? Yes, right. let's do that. All right. Um, I followed DigitalOcean because I bought a VPS last week. Yay! Um, nice. Or right after we recorded the last show, I bought it and I figured out Docker. And now my weather bots are deployed via Docker on my VPS. I call it uh, Mir because it's a remote server, you know, like a satellite, but hopefully nice. it doesn't crash and burn. If I buy another um, VPS in the future, I will call it ISS. And uh, after a, a small amount of, or a single crash, which was just a, a poor. I had a comp, comp file support for WeatherBot so I could more easily manage it via Docker. Uh, awesome. Messed up a line, so it crashed once, but otherwise it's been the same Python script running for six days, and it has not died yet, so that's good. So was it worth that's it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. It's it's nice not having or just knowing that 18 hours a day is all it can run because Heroku <laughs> throttles, and I don't want to pay seven dollars per month per per twitter account so yeah it's nice having it up all the time i don't really know what else i'll use this vps for you'll find it, it it's not using much or it's not using many resources because this bot sleeps for three minutes runs for a couple seconds and sleeps again so oh you know it starts with a couple of bots and then it starts with a vps and then it they take over the world <laughs> yeah the we'll, see, about we'll see how long it lasts so you bought the smallest digital ocean yep. slice, right? Using your promo code. Woo-hoo! So my first two months are free. And then after, what, five, you'll get $25 credit? Uh, something like that, maybe. I don't know. Cool. And yeah. I added, uh, I liked your affiliate links on your website, so I added <laughs> affiliate links on mine. You know, I, I feel sort of terrible for putting them there, but um, it turns out that I think, um, I think I think it's a good thing to have them. I mean, you having them there prompted me to use it. So you just gained $25 by having them there. So that's pretty good. Right. And I'm so <laughs> one of the things that I'm struggling with, though, is trying to figure out what services have them. And, and, mm-hmm. and Dropbox has it. Okay, Dropbox. Okay. I never used that, but I could, I could put it there. 
I have Dropbox and DigitalOcean on mine. I know, I know Amazon has affiliate links for any product, really, but yeah, that's harder. And I didn't. So you have I, to generate it on a product by product basis, right? Yeah. And I, I don't. So. And I so don't want to do really, that. And I think Google gets aggressive in terms of when uh, a result shows up on its site if you have affiliate links for everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if Google will know that these are necessarily affiliate links because they're redirecting through my HTTPS adept work redirector right. thing. Okay. Got to track those links, you know. <laughs> right. Yep. I know the DigitalOcean one track or tells you how many people have clicked it. So that's kind of nice. But For sure. Well, Ryan. Cool. That's all for me. So, Ryan, do you have any new Twitter followees? <laughs> me? No. No, I don't. Okay. I don't um I don't follow a lot of people. All right. Well, it sounds like it's time for me to talk through my Twitter followees. It is. Um and as usual I have 80 million. Uh but I uh, culled them down to just a handful of folks who I met at Signal that were really cool. Uh as is tradition, I think I did this same thing last year at Signal as well. So uh, the first one is Katie Mo, who did a really awesome talk on uh, APIs for cyborgs. Um, mm. So she uh, talked about um, ways that you can, uh, like people have NFC transponders built into, into their hand, for example, and you can um, build apps that take advantage of that. Um, and it was, yeah, it's really neat. She's a really cool person. And she did some really awesome stuff at the uh, hackathon that they're calling Bash uh, afterwards. So. Uh, her Twitter wow. account is really awesome. It's called Bash. Really... Huh. Of course it is. <clears throat> um, and and she's uh, just a really awesome person whose Twitter account is worth following. Then there's this guy whose name is Dan Kilmer. He's actually from around uh, around town from So I Hear, around, around uh, the Minneapolis and St. Paul area. In addition to being that cool person, uh, he also works on the Authy team at Twilio, so he does a lot of two-factor authentication stuff. His talk was about how to implement... Uh, essentially two-factor authentication in an application in like 20 minutes or less uh and he did that like three times in his 45 minute talk so it was it was pretty uh pretty neat Hmm. uh and then the third uh follow we i'm going to give a shout out to here is uh at sagnew shreds who is uh sam agnew who is a developer uh evangelist at twilio really cool dude and his hair is awesome he introduced a bunch of the talks that i went to and is a generally cool person. Finally, we've got at JDAN, at JDAN, uh, it's Jordan. Jordan uh, works for Khan Academy and is a total rock star. He built the uh, A11, or to- totally the um, uh, accessibility framework, uh, accessibility testing framework for, for websites. Um, and it is really awesome. I think I mentioned that at some point, um, but the reason why I'm pulling him back up here uh, is because uh, he had a bunch of funny tweets, and I love every last one of them. And they're going into uh, the show notes right about now. Hmm. I'm, I'm reading through one of his blog posts about you know making a website in 2000, or well, making a web page in 2016. That, that's amusing. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> he's a goofball. Yep, total rock star though. And that profile picture, like, just can't beat it. Not even once. Yep. So I guess that's that's about it for me. Going one over uh, on the uh, on the whole. Uh, well, you, you, you can thing. make up for me and Ryan's lack of followers. <laughs> so I see you, Brandon. Uh-huh. As of recording this, follow two thousand one hundred ninety nine people, and oh, I feel like when I met you last summer, it was closer to twelve hundred. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But my follower count has also increased substantially. I'm now at over a thousand followers, which is uh, different since last time we 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 uh, spoke. So, so you you yes. have all these followers, <laughs> but where why aren't they listening to the show and sending us feedback that neither of us can find? <laughs> <laughs> it might be because it might be because. Uh, they're all bots. I hope not, but it might be because they're all bots. I think a lot of bots follow me. I think of my on my tech account of my ninety five followers, probably sixty five to seventy of them are bots. Yeah. I have, I have three no bots idea how for, to... per person. Yeah. 
I have no idea how to count though. So that there are lots of cool people that um yeah, some of them definitely seem like bots. Um So actually there's some there are some real people in here too. I don't know. Yeah. Lots lots of the people who fall actually follow me on Twitter are um uh like people from the Minneapolis St. Paul area but aren't necessarily super techie. And that's a okay. Mm-hmm. But as a result, I think they kind of gloss over when I tweet about tech. And most of the time when my tech stuff gets read, it's because I'm at a conference and I use the hashtag. <laughs> yeah. But we'll see. That's you, you bring up uh huh. How my my Twitter bots get followers and there are there will be times where a single account will retweet or like five or six tweets in a row. And I think sometimes it's a location based thing if I'm moving around. But other times it's just some keyword at some time, some bot just likes the tweet and retweets it. So I, I report bots for spam quite a bit because my same. Twitter bots. Same, same, same. Well, I ah, think yes. uh, I think that was a mm-hmm. uh, pretty good show. Agreed. Yeah. So you know what time it is. What time is it? Where can we find you on the internet time? Oh, well, me. You can find me uh, on Twitter at brandon underscore mn or uh on my website which is brandon.mn those are the main places you can find me but you can also find me uh at other places through those places so like github and all that stuff is linked to on said website uh in a little while you will find me uh running around the north loop uh at a new place where i will be working on things uh so that'll be quite neat uh we'll probably see some more tweets about that uh, and that'll be pretty darn cool nice well you can find me on Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore or at bman4789 or on my website, brianm.me, very recently updated and a new blog post about my experience with tech crew in college. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter. Is that, do I use Twitter still? Anybody know? <laughs> uh, I think you do occasionally. Oh, yeah. right. A Twitter at Ryan Amar, And of course, on the Google. No, do I even use Google? Hmm. Do I do anything anymore? Okay, well, you can find me at my new blog, which is still not made yet. Hmm. I don't know. You can find me somewhere, probably everywhere, eventually. <laughs> All well, right. There we go. Yeah, see you uh, when we see you next. Yep, see you have next a good time. one.